So welcome, I'm uh, Paul Sweeney, Member of the Scottish Parliament and Member of the Citizens Participation and Public Petitions Committee. I'd like to welcome you all to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. This afternoon's panel is titled Resilient and Sustainable Cities and is in partnership with my alma mater, the University of Glasgow. We are delighted that so many people are able to join us online today and I look forward to hearing comments and questions from you as we get stuck into our discussion over the coming hour. Um, so, to cut to the chase, are Scottish towns and cities about to be recreated as the ultimate in 15 to 20 minute neighbourhoods? How will we retrofit the Scottish tenement? And where does cheap city transport come into the equation? This panel will aim to address all of these big questions in the next 60 minutes or so. So, do stay with us. We are delighted that you're able to join us to take part, and I would encourage you all to use the event chat function to introduce yourself, stating your name and your, where you're from, and pose any questions that you'd like the panel to respond to, and I'll make sure I get them to the panellists. And I'm very pleased to be joined by our three panellists. To start with, it's Councillor Anna Richardson, who's Glasgow City Councillors, uh, Glasgow City Council's Convener for Sustainability and Carbon Reduction. We have Duncan McLennan. Professor of Public Policy at the University of Glasgow and Professor of Strategic Urban Management and Finance at the University of St Andrews. And last but not least, we have Jenny Elliott, Chartered Landscape Architect and Urban Designer. So there will be, as I mentioned, an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. And if you'd like to make that contribution, please just put them into the question and answer box. You'll see it on the right hand side. And make sure to state your first name and where you're from, uh, and we'll get through as many as possible. However, I'd like to kick things off by asking each of our panelists to summarise very concisely uh, what we mean when we talk about a resilient and sustainable city. It sounds like a jargon that could mean anything, so let's drill into what it actually means. Give an example of what a sustainable city globally would look like. What's the benchmark, and what's the closest thing Glasgow has to a resilient city at the moment? So I'll come first to Councillor Richardson from Glasgow, and then Duncan McLennan. Uh, and Jenny Elliott. So, Councillor Richardson, um, I'd like to invite you to outline your initial thoughts. Thanks. Thanks. I think a sustainable and resilient city is one that is providing a good quality of life for all of its citizens um, across that city um, while having a low uh, carbon footprint, while not having uh, a negative impact on the climate. And I think that's something that is really significant, especially in Glasgow, when we're looking at making our city uh, more climate friendly, it also has to be one that is raising the living standards of all of our people and, and reducing inequality where we can. Um, and it's also going to have to be a city that adapts, um, that is flexible and able to, to deal with the change in climate. We know our climate will change to an extent no matter what we do now. Um, and so we need to think about resilience in terms of how does that ensure that our communities um, and all of our services infrastructure can respond to that, um, so that when we're, we're bringing in mitigation measures um, against emissions, we're also thinking about how we're adapting and making that a city that, that can look to the future and can adapt to that change in climate. Um, when I think about what sustainability looks like uh, in other cities across Europe and further afield, the ones that always draw my attention are the ones that have been really bold about addressing car use, uh, about looking at how they, they get the transport right, how they make sustainable transport really straightforward um, for everybody, make that first choice for everybody. Uh, and I'm thinking about a lot of cities that do that. I, I don't think you, you can choose one and say they've got it right. We need to be inspired by the cities that are um, taking the bold action that needs to happen, um, thinking, for example, about Paris uh, and how they are consistently bringing in ever uh, bolder measures, and they're seeing um, how that's changing how people move. I think we can all take inspiration from what's happening elsewhere and apply that to our own cities. And in terms of Glasgow, I think we are showing that we have a willingness and a commitment to take that big action. Um, as a city, we're already moving in the right direction. We're seeing that our carbon emissions are going down. Uh, but what we now need to do is, is shift the pace, uh, go faster, go bigger, go bolder. Um, I think we're a city with the, the attitude that, that can do that and we'll be able to cope with that. Um, and I think as well, we're a city that's really embedding social justice in everything that we do. Um, and uh, that's coming through in our climate plan. That's coming through in the way that we're approaching uh, reducing our carbon emissions. And I think that's something that we can be quite proud of here in Glasgow. Okay, um, thanks very much for out outlining your thoughts, Councillor Richardson. Uh, Duncan McLennan, do you have any particular views on world-leading benchmark cities that we could look towards and where you think there's some good examples in Scotland at the moment? 
I think that uh, if you look at the a lot of the West European cities in Scandinavia and Germany, um, I think they've made steady progress over a long period of time, uh, embedding ideas about sustainability within communities. I think they've also gotten citizens much closer to understanding what the real issues are. To, in a sense, uh, reach zero carbon, we and to have sustainable cities, we do have to have uh, lots of ideas about climate science. We have to have lots of uh, new technologies. But shifting the perceptions of citizens and what they accept, uh, and also uh, really engaging this with communities from the bottom up. And where, where I think I see a real problem in uh, Glasgow and Scottish cities, vis a vis more or less all of Europe, more or less all the rest of the world, is local authorities have lots of obligations, no powers, and very little cash. Uh, so, if we want sustainable cities, we're going to have to rethink fiscal Scotland. We're going to have to start building it from below. I agree with a lot of what Anna said. I actually don't like the idea of 15-minute neighbourhoods, but we can talk about that later because I think it's sloppy thinking. Um, but I do think across the board, uh, Anna's got it right in terms we have to be aiming for. In Scotland, I think there are parts of a sustainable city that we've done quite well, issues about green space, uh, issues about reduction of certain uh, air pollution, uh, but the fundamental issues about grasping the big issues about carbon uh, in the industrial sector, carbon uh, in uh, domestic heating and transportation, we're not really any better than anywhere else, and we're struggling to get there at the moment. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not giving you a specific city, but I think it's a bad idea to do that. We have to look across the range of the experience. And I agree with a lot of what Anna said, but not everything. So maybe we'll come back to that. That's fair enough. I don't want to get too neurotic about comparing ourselves to any one city. So uh, Jenny, would you like to come in uh, and give us your thoughts? Um, maybe you want to pitch a particular example that you're particularly inspired by, but no pressure. <laughs> sure. Um, well, firstly, I mean, I agree with almost everything that Anna and Duncan have said already. Um, so, I mean, I'd, when thinking about what made a sustainable and resilient city, I'd been thinking um, along, there's a few points that kind of, kind of maybe summarise a few of those things as well around, it's about inclusive design and decision making, it's about green infrastructure networks and habitat and embedding those within and throughout the city, um, and truly prioritising sustainable, low carbon and active travel, and making that kind of the logical choice and feel safe and accessible. Um, and in terms of resilience being, I guess, resilience is perhaps defined in terms of being responsive and adaptive to change. And I think particularly the last year and a half, we've seen particularly, I mean, I'm biased, I'm an urban designer and uh, particularly chartered landscape architect. So a lot of my work is about public spaces, but seeing how public spaces have been used and kind of uh, kind of their importance has really been demonstrated, I think, in recent times. And so um, I think, how do we keep some of those, those things that we've learned from the last year and a half? But I guess specific projects, I, I, was, I was torn between a, a whole lot. Um, I agree with Anna, I think Paris is doing fantastic work. They, they, they're planning to cover half the city with planted areas by 2030, um, including next to quite major landmarks, which is really what that comes into that boldness that I think you need as well. Um, I mean, there's obviously a, the High Line is a really well-known example in New York, and that's, that's a really fantastic project because it really embeds that green infrastructure within the city. Um, and in Scotland, there's lots of great projects happening, and Glasgow is doing fantastic work actually with the, the avenues projects. And um, also, I think I don't know if you've heard of Tornagrain, which is near Inverness, um, which is um, I believe it's the first neighbourhoods being built at the moment that's been built around this idea that services and um, are within a very short walk of five minutes. And I think they're taking quite a longer term um, approach to building these neighbourhoods that are, are kind of better connected to these services, which comes up a lot in this idea of the 15-minute city. So not one, not one city in particular, but lots of good examples, I think. Well, thanks, Jenny. That's that's really interesting. I think um, I was just looking to see if we've got any comments yet. Nothing yet, but uh, feel free to to jump in if you've got any thoughts on what the panels have said. I'll I'll make it unashamedly Glasgow biased. So. Um, I think um, the point that the Duncan raised was quite interesting. You know, there's been a lot of really ambitious proposals coming through for example, the Connectivity Commission, um, which was published for Glasgow in 2019, um, which outlined the idea of building this integrated transport system for the city. Um, and the one thing that has been quite stressful has been like, how do we actually deliver it as a city region? Because we don't, we have like 
numerous different council areas. We have divisions of power between the Scottish government, Scottish government agencies, uh, councils. So it is a bit challenging to pull a team together to deliver these sorts of big infrastructure projects at pace. So um, I, I certainly find that landscape quite frustrating. After 21 years of devolution, have we got the mix right in terms of the power balance between cities and the central government to how to deliver these kind of projects in Scotland? I'd just be interested to invite some of your thoughts. Um, uh, Duncan, it was you who raised that issue was about local government, so feel free to, to chip in. Um, uh, my my comment was about Glasgow specifically, but it applies to uh, all Scottish cities, uh, even the ones that are properly cities. Uh, uh, the uh, I think in, in the the issue in relation to somewhere like Glasgow in terms of implementing the connectivity strategy, I'm on the economic commission for the Glasgow city region, so I try and take a a, a big picture view of what's happening. It strikes me that there are really fundamental strategic decisions uh, for the parts of Scotland that aren't growing very quickly, as opposed to those that are growing quite quickly. If you're dealing with Edinburgh and areas round about it, it's a different set of decisions you have to take. It's about controlling and minimising the impact of the footprint of change. In the Glasgow context, you've got lots of vacant land close to the city centre. Uh, I know that COVID is encouraging people to get out of dense situations. That's not going to last long. Uh, carbon tax, dealing with carbon, uh, is really aiming at much denser neighbourhoods and using land close to city centres. That's going to be the effective solution for cities globally, is to use that space. But yet, yeah, in the west of Scotland, we have the problem that uh, Western Bartonshire and Inverclyde are still declining in population. So, what do you do in terms of your big strategic infrastructure? Uh, there isn't actually a coherent strategic infrastructure plan for the Glasgow City region, and part of it is the difficulty in politics. Sorry, Paul, I'm not, I'm not getting at politicians here. It's a really tough decision, but we don't have resources to do everything in Scotland. Not everybody, particularly, I mean, we're talking about second industrial revolution or green industrial revolution. Things can't stay the same uh, and, and us be creative. Resilience deals with, uh, involves dealing with changing places and change, actually sometimes having to change where we live. And I think that we don't really get that in our decision taking in Scotland. We, we try to protect everywhere. And we're not going to be able to do it if we take carbon seriously. So that that's why I, I want community and I want a lot of local power to make these decisions, because I don't think they've been made by uh, the parliament. I, I was a special advisor to the three first ministers, and nobody made strategic spatial decisions. Well, that's interesting. Um, certainly, a challenge to some of our, our political uh, thinkers across parties and how we approach the system of governance in Scotland. So, um, Anna, I would just like to get your view as a councillor in Glasgow um, for several years, and um, how you see the landscape. Would you see Glasgow compared to, say, Greater Manchester or other or city regions around Europe? Um, how do you think we can maybe build greater resilience in our, in our governance structures to deliver some of these big ambitious projects we need to do? Do you think it's good enough, or do you think we could do, do more with, in terms of building those institutions? I think that conversation definitely needs to continue um, around transport and how we make those strategic decisions. Uh, but what I will say is I'll never um, argue against local authorities having more powers uh, or having more funding um, for us to decide what we, we do with that. Um, one of the things that's become very clear um, in the work that I'm doing is that as a local authority, we're often delivering on the ambitions that the Scottish Government puts in place, um, often with their funding. Um, but when we're delivering on those, we're the ones that are very much on the ground engaging with communities, um, You know, whether that's as simple as, as train, changing a streetscape, uh, whether that's implementing new strategy. We're delivering on the ground and, and having to make decisions about how we use the space in the city. And even within you know, the, the ambitions we have at the moment, we have to make choices about, yes, we have vacant derelict land, what will be used for housing, what needs to be used for open space, what needs to be used for food growing, what needs to be used for different amenities that, that communities will need. So we have to have those conversations on that very local uh, level and make those decisions. Um, so I think as politicians, we are very, very close to what's happening in communities. I think we have a real strong understanding of where the barriers to delivery can be. Um, and certainly, you know, we're, we're often having conversations with government about what powers would be more useful, uh, what, what um, changes to legislation would help us and would unlock 
um, the, the work that we need to get on with. So um, more powers, more money. Yeah, of course, we'll take both of them. No problem. OK. Um, good to have some consensus breakout uh, already. Um, so, Jenny, just I wonder if you've got projects that you've done in the past, you think maybe it could have been more rapid. Maybe the community found it frustrating that they weren't able to pursue certain ideas more rapidly because of bureaucracy or certain decision making that wasn't fluid enough. Have you got experience of sort of frustrations that you might have encountered that could be better? Um, I think definitely having community involvement in projects and big projects like that is really critical and from having that from really early in that process. So right at the start, communities have a, a chance to voice how things are shaped and, and ideally help shape them in kind of in tandem with gov government and local authorities in that respect as well. I mean, I think I agree with and we're probably all on a similar page with a lot of the things that have been discussed and I think I'd, I, in terms of some of these bigger projects and especially if we are trying to move towards more kind of 15 minute cities or 20 minute neighborhoods whichever you want to whichever terminology you want to go with I think the two things that I'm kind of mindful of are about kind of making sure you don't further entrench inequality and other ways to do that in a way that is actually good in terms of social justice and is not not just gentrifying one area and and having a negative impact as a result but also as well about accessibility and really ensuring that our built environment and our cities are really prioritizing accessibility because a lot of those projects I've worked on have been to do with public spaces and you know the kind of everyday streets that you you might go out your front door and walk to the shop and actually I think um, those kind of projects having like the importance of those spaces really being recognized as the difference between if you feel if you're less mobile or perhaps you're an older resident and you like you need to have kind of good quality pavement, you know, wide pavements, so you're not going to get jostled on your way to the shop, like all these kind of, um, I think the quality of public realm and the quality of all the spaces in our city, do you have these kind of everyday impacts on the way we live our lives? And whether that's choosing to take a sustainable travel mode or not, or choosing like the level of independence you have as you get older, all of these things have a huge impact on the way we live our lives. And it's through things like community engagement early in the process you can start to understand the city from that kind of, I guess in the tech world, it would be called user experience and kind of UX design, but but for the city, like how is this working for everybody and genuinely everybody, whether they're three or 93 in that process as well. And so it's really kind of close to my, input, my heart anyway. <laughs> Definitely, and I think it, it, we under I think we probably underestimate the impact it has on well-being and psychology, and just especially when and viewed through more aspiration, uh, more prosperous neighbourhoods versus more deprived neighbourhoods. So I think there's definitely a power imbalance there. Um, I've got a couple of comments, so I'll, I'll just read them out. One from Scott Davis, he's saying Duncan is correct, so you've got support in the audience, uh, Duncan. Uh, Resilience talks about how civil society should transform and adapt. The truth is that our political, social, and economics need to first urgently transform. Communities should be resourced to allow local-based solutions to emerge, not copying cities. Uh, and he also says, um, how can we ask the communities to transform and adapt when they have no agency? Airbnb of Edinburgh City Council, therefore local neighbourhoods over a barrel, and neighbourhoods have little to no say on the future of their places. That institutional disparity needs addressed. So that's something to ponder. Um, I was struck, uh, Duncan, by your comment that you didn't Think 15-minute neighbourhoods was a or 15-minute city was a useful way of thinking of things. So that's quite a challenge to one of the questions I've got here. It says, um, you know, people refer to the ultimate being this 15-minute city. Um, how can we achieve it without worsening the existing inequalities between neighbourhoods within cities? So I'm um, just interested that you're a bit of a sceptic about this this kind of catchphrase or or, or um, sort of uh, buzzword these days of 15-minute, uh, 20-minute neighbourhoods. Um, fire away. See what, see what you think about that. Uh, well, let me make two quick points and then give you three reasons why I have a concern <laughs> about it. Uh, first quick point is, as an academic who's done quite a lot of work on cities and worked in government as well as academia, even I could do uh, an effective, uh, highly accessible neighbourhood in the 7th or 14th arrondissement in uh, Paris. So I don't think. I mean, you have to make some decisions, but it's quite easy to do. You could do it in the West End of Glasgow. You can do it in Stockbridge and Edinburgh really easily. Uh, you go out to Castle Milk, and there's a different challenge there. If you go to the Grand Ensemble in the edge of Paris, different challenge. So that uh, you have to be really careful uh, about thinking uh, about what you're doing. Uh, and the, the first uh, really important thing, I think, is 
I actually think the essential concept of the idea in Paris and the, 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 the advocate is wrong about how the economy of cities operates. Now, we want to take account of natural capital. I'm not going, to, I'm not saying we do anything other than well-being or natural capital, but you can't throw issues about productivity and what drives the logic of employment locations out the window. And that's what that analysis does. Uh, firms gather together in places uh, where there are effective interactions and there are high accessibility points to the labour market of the city as a whole. You can't solve the jobs issue in 15-minute neighbourhoods. That's the first point. The second point is if we look at facilities, uh, you can't have uh, what we call higher order goods. You know the sort of things that are big. Uh, you need a big market, a big uh, a threshold to make them operate. You can't have them in it. You can have grocery stores in every neighbourhood and a whole range of facilities. You can't have everything. So you can't do it. It's just not consistent with the logic of how cities spatially organise, uh, whether it's American or European or Australasian cities. So that's my first objection. But the actual uh, delivery of uh, the idea, uh, I think, uh, whose neighbourhood are we talking about? I've done work on children's perceptions, old people's perceptions of neighbourhoods. They have a different perception of where the neighbourhood is and what it is. So that um, whose neighbourhood are we talking about? Where are we going to put the centre of the neighbourhood that we're talking about? These are all actual questions you have to answer if you're going to deliver this as opposed to say, well, this is a good thing. I fully agree that people should have as much accessibility to good services and good infrastructures as possible. Uh, but I do think that uh, this completely uh, analysis completely ignores the supply side of these things. I did a back of the envelope calculation of what you would require to invest in neighbourhood infrastructure in Glasgow to deliver uh, the Parisian idea of an effective neighbourhood. You would actually have to spend three times the amount every year uh, of the total value of the existing. A city deal. In other words, you'd have to be spending about two or three billion a year uh, to actually reach uh, these uh, 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 service levels in neighbourhoods in Glasgow uh, within about 10 years. And I don't think that's realistic. So I don't want a language that's going to let people down. You know, what I do say is we have to commit to doing our best to make services accessible, particularly for poor people. We do have to get people out of their cars and onto bikes. But actually, I think punting an idea that is actually really half baked, and I think the Scottish government and bureaucrats, uh, I'm never going to get a research contract again, uh, but Scottish government and bureaucrats should have thought this through much harder before they actually pushed out uh, as a, a solution. So I really agree with the aims of this, but it's not very good in terms of understanding the geography of how the economy of a city operates. So. And I, I would also just add, the state never did a great job in identifying the services and structures that should be in neighbourhoods when we had big public housing investment. So who's going to determine what the neighbourhood service mix? It's a critical element in the city. If you read Jane Jacobs or anything else, that there's evolution within neighbourhoods. It comes from below. It comes from businesses and so on. And that's not the sense I get. The Parisian uh, experiment is very much an ideological position on cities, and it's very much a top-down view of what you do, and I don't agree with that. Neither, much, neither ideologically <laughs> nor technically. Right, fair enough, Duncan. That's a fairly robust response to, to that. Um, a question from Andy in Glasgow has asked, what do you mean, Duncan, by um, we need to build from below? I think you maybe referenced that, but Jane Jacobs so, uh, is a very seminal author on some of this urban planning stuff um, back from the 60s. but. Um, he's just saying, you know, given the context of local government being cap strapped for cash, how, how do we build from below realistically? Um. Uh, I, uh, I did a report last summer for David Hume Institute. It was called a, a Scotland of Better Places. And it was drafted on the basis of listening to roughly 700 people talk about what they would want and their lived experiences. And I hope I didn't distort the, uh, what they said too much. But what came through really clearly is we've got experience of putting in place in Glasgow. This is really obvious. We've put in place community institutions and community organisations. 
community-based housing associations are the best example, probably, of this. Oh, I think we maybe lost uh, Duncan there. He's been cut off on his prime. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll bring him back in when he gets back online. Uh, Anna, it was interesting he was talking about community-based housing associations, because I suppose that's something that's pioneered in Glasgow. And I suppose Glasgow's story over the last century has been going from a very compact city to a quite a sprawling city with less less people living in the city centre. So just wanted to get your view about the, the idea of the 15-minute neighbourhood and you know some of the structural challenges that Glasgow faces, given it over the last 50 years or so, the city's kind of been spread more thinly across a wider surface area. Now we're talking about this idea of redensifying the city. So just to get some of your thoughts around that, if that be all right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think um, when we talk about twenty-minute neighbourhoods and, and fifty-minute cities, these are just um, these are just ways of, I think, reiterating two two basic points about city life, which can be really positive, which are about density and they're about mixed use. Um, if if you're thinking about a 15 minute or 20 minute city, I think sometimes we can get a bit caught up in exactly um, what we mean by that and exactly what has to be within those neighbourhoods. And actually, what we need to be thinking about is the real benefit of a city um, when you get the density right and when you get the the, the the land use right and when you get that mixture of of activities happening. That's that's city life, and that's what brings vibrancy, and, and that's what people want to live in, in cities for. Um, and I think the the 15 minute city idea is really just trying to to emphasise that. Certainly, I think um, exactly what Duncan was saying about certain parts of cities almost lend themselves to this. Um, I'm in the south side of Glasgow, but thinking of parts of the West End as well. Um, during lockdown, citizens were almost living that 20-minute neighbourhood themselves because anything they could walk or cycle to, they were using. They were suddenly using the local corner shops rather than going to the out-of-town supermarket or, or wherever they, they would usually have travelled because people were really reducing their journeys right down where possible. So we were seeing that some places are, I think, as Duncan said, naturally already almost on, on the road to that. And all we need to do is a little bit of a nudge in terms of reducing the amount of space that's given over to cars, for example, so that we've got more space for, for the urban greening and um, for all the, the, the good landscape work that, that Jenny was talking about um, to enable people to use the street in more social ways again, um, without worrying about pollution, without worrying about uh, traffic safety. Um, so I think in, in some neighbourhoods, we're really almost there and we just need to do a little bit of more creative um, street design. But we've got this really big problem that Duncan was talking about as well, about areas of Glasgow where we have this conversation. They don't have the choice of a supermarket because they don't have a supermarket. They maybe don't have um, good access to affordable fresh food within their community. They maybe don't even have the transport links they need to be getting to those higher order services that Duncan was talking about. Um, and we can't leave those neighbourhoods behind. We can't create this where it's easy and leave other neighbourhoods behind. So the approach that we're taking in Glasgow is around livable neighbourhoods. Um, we have committed to over 10 years to going out to every single um, community within the city and looking at what that concept means for them and what we can do. It's primarily about connections. It's about walking, cycling and wheeling becoming easier. It's about seeing where we can um, make those neighbourhoods more appealing so that, that people are able to enjoy the streets and are able to, to get where they need to and create more independence. I think, you know, the thinking around children and, and the elderly. If, if we design streets and neighbourhoods that fit their needs, I'm pretty certain that they'll fit everyone else's needs as well. And I'm really interested in how we can use that children's perspective or, or those people that have um, mobility issues and how we can really um, make neighbourhoods that work for them. I think that would be a really positive um, you know, approach to this. It, but within those communities, we know that not everything is, is there for them. Um, and we need to tackle that and we need to make sure that when we're bringing in these policies, we're not just focusing on the, on the quick wins or the, or the easy areas, because I think that will exacerbate inequality. And that's something that's you know absolutely unacceptable. And we have to be lifting the parts of Glasgow up um, as we do this. So um, I really don't think that we can apply 15 Minute City as you know the only solution to things. It's simply one way of looking around those ideas of how do we make dense, vibrant neighbourhoods? How do we stop um, that you know sprawl um, that makes it harder to to enable people to live sustainably. That makes people lock in perhaps to car um, households because they don't have other op opportunities there for them. How do we start to to think about the way we build cities with that climate perspective because of that density? But again, um, giving people those options um, and giving them really nice places to live. Uh, so so that's my perspective um, on a lot of these issues and how they start to tie together. 
Thanks very much, Anna. Uh, I suppose it is a, a challenge because you know you can contrast a neighbourhood like you know Deniston or or, or Partick to somewhere like Rob Royston, and it's uh, if you're looking from a Glasgow perspective and just say you know like you know the, the demand for those neighbourhoods it speaks for itself. You know, like uh, you know the most desirable communities seem to still be those ones which have retained that density, that kind of spark of vibrancy. Uh, which the Victorians laid out in, with such vision a uh, hundred odd years ago, uh, Jenny. I just was curious about that idea about laying out landscapes or laying out uh, streetscapes that are, you know, loved and are sustainable. You know, you see so often kind of bits of landscaping that are done almost as a half an afterthought, and they're often dilapidated very quickly. They're, they're very maintenance intensive, not very efficient, uh, and they aren't well used because they're just seen as something that's nice and a top down drawing, but they don't work in the same way that say. You know, a really lovely, um, well thought out neighbourhood such as the Meadows in Edinburgh or Kelvin Grove Park in Glasgow works because it's a very dense neighbourhood packed around a park, which kind of delights someone as they arrive in it from a kind of dense city. Uh, just to kind of get your view about what what way can we build that idea of like beauty and sort of green space within that? What what this idea of it militating towards a, a denser city environment is? Mm -hmm. So I think those spaces, um, I think there's some really interesting examples you used just then as well, and green infrastructure and creating those kind of, not just for people, also kind of habitats for biodiversity as well is really important. Um, and actually can really, you know, there's a lot of well-established research about the importance of green infrastructure and in parks on human health and well-being. So it's kind of, it's very well known, obviously, that integrating this kind of green infrastructure in our cities is a really good thing. And I think for me, the really interesting question is like, how do we how do we make that happen in reality, and not just in the meadows in Edinburgh, you know, where there's a whole host of kind of historical reasons that that's ended up the way it has done. But I think for me, what's quite interesting is the you know we have the cities that we have at the moment, and how do we go from where we are here to where we want to be? And I think the 15 minute city or 20 minute neighbourhood, whichever you want term you want to use, I think in a slight disagreement with Duncan, I'm really sorry, um, is that I think actually that's that's something good to aim for. And it's perhaps not yeah, it's it's not going to be possible in every place at all. But I think if you take that um that definition of a of of a 15 minute city as I think I've written down a few points that seem to come up a lot around good active travel infrastructure, public realm, green space enhancement, traffic reduction, providing necessary services with an easy reach and more dense housing and use of land. Actually, those are just those are good good aspirations. And whilst it might not be possible everywhere, I think there's something good to strive for. Um, but you're right, some places that's much easier to do than others. Um, there might be, for example, some of those places where you're saying perhaps it, you know, the maintenance isn't right, or there's other reasons that it's not as successful where there has been in green infrastructure put in. There's a whole host of different reasons that could have been. I think there's Speaking as a landscape architect and urban designer, I think there's a lot of fantastic um, landscape architects out there who would love to get their hands on a, um, a street that perhaps isn't performing or public space that isn't performing so well. And, you know, they know how to make it, how to do sort of really great design to make it work really well, how to embed kind of community engagement in that process to make sure it's meeting people's needs as well. But I think often budgets, obviously, of course, are a problem. Um, I'm actually doing a PhD at the moment on this topic. <laughs> um, so it's something that's quite yeah. close to my heart, but it's like, how do we actually, what are the barriers to making those better places in practice? And how can we, how can we get there? How can we work out where the kind of the stumbling blocks are so we can get over them? Um, and I think it's going to be different in every single, in every single place. Um, each place has its own, own kind of um, history, its own community, its own way of working. So it's kind of hard to answer in generalities, but I think, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of things we can try and do from, yeah, in making sure we have that community engagement early in the process, having that mix of kind of top down leadership and a really strong vision that's whether it's a 15 minute city you're aiming for or whatever the, the kind of those principles you're aiming for and what a good place looks like. You need some like strong top down leadership and budgets to be able to do it, as well as that kind of bottom up kind of evolution of place that naturally happens and ways we can make those two things work really well together, I think is where there's a, probably a sweet spot in the middle, maybe. But um, right. that's just my take on it. <laughs> yeah, um, that's really, really interesting. When you, when you mentioned that, the thing that sprung to mind in my head was the Clay Pits, uh, the Scottish Canals led project in the north of Glasgow, where they've redeveloped this Forth and Clyde Canal. And there's been huge levels of community engagement and there's like local leadership on it. And I think it's been a really good example. Um, 
And I, I think, you know, if it's, it's one of these things where you see a microcosm of good practice that you wonder how do you scale it, how do you create the resilience of the, in, the institutions to drive it across across a region or a city, um, you know, rather than just being a sort of um, one-off project. And I think that's one of the maybe the challenges we need to think at when we do see something working really well. How do you make? How do you capture what made it well it work well and try and build that into a set of rules that are, and everyone works towards? You know, easier said than done. Though, and I'd be interested to get your view on like how we might look at doing that in Glasgow. I suppose there's been the Avenues project. There's been some of the active travel initiatives in the city, particularly during the pandemic. Um, some have been really successful, um, and others maybe have been a bit more controversial. Um, but it'd just be interested to get your take on like how you you see is building that kind of community led approach um, to sort of driving projects around it, just being seen as something that's happening to a community, and everybody's kind of like just kind of like we'll we'll see how it works. Are a bit sceptical about whether it will be successful or not. I think one of the things that really leads to success is when people feel that they're consulted, they're heard, and then. There is activity as a result of that. So clay pits being a reality, the fact that uh, all of those community organisers, everybody that was involved in that, can walk through that and point and say, "We did this. We did this together." Um, and I think that is what spurs people on to feel that it's worth getting engaged with their communities, whether that's through community councils or or organisations or, or just in, in informal campaign groups. Uh, and I think that's something that in Glasgow we really need to show people that when they engage with us, when they work with us, we will deliver um, on those aspirations that they have. Um, I think that's one of the opportunities we have through livable neighbourhoods uh, and through a lot of the active travel work that we're doing. Obviously, that's not the only um, type of project that's happening, but certainly when you talk to people about their own streets and about what they want them to look like, yes, that will be controversial. And, and, and Paul, you refer to you know Spaces for People, I think, was an incredible success despite a huge number of challenges, not to mention the fact that we delivered that during a pandemic. Um, unheard of um, to do so, and absolutely unheard of to deliver that scale of change on our streets with no consultation, because we were in emergency measures and, and we treated the pandemic uh, as such when it came to our, our street design as well. Um, you know, so, so that was very, very challenging, but it did open up conversations, and now we need to, to continue to build on those um, and to really engage with people about what they want those streets to look like and, and what they want their, their city to, to function like and, and, and how their, their neighbourhoods can can be part of that. So um, I do think when it comes to engaging with our communities, we need to really be listening to them. And then we need to show that because of um, the engagement we've had with them, we are now delivering something um, that means something to them. Uh, I think that's that's absolutely the heart of it. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, Duncan, well, we've got you because I know you've been, uh, you're, you're dialing in from uh, rural Nova Scotia. So I know that the line's a bit ropey. So uh, we'll try and capture you while you're, yeah. while you're here. <laughs> um, just listening to uh, able to hear some of that conversation uh, just about like engagement. I know you were saying that this is critical to build from below. Um, how practical do you think this might be in the context of, of you know significant funding constraints? How do we be more innovative about building a, a city economy that's not necessarily uh, you know dependent on top-down financing? Can we do things that are a bit more innovative from below to sort of use public assets to generate wealth for local communities? Um, yes, we can. So, uh, apologies. I felt like a bad boy who said something awful and then ran away. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, I, hope, I hope I don't disappear too quickly. Um, I think that uh, I was really saying that the fiscal powers of cities need to be much bigger, and they probably have to think about city regions in terms of collaborative projects. In other words, the basic fiscal structure in Scotland stinks in terms of making good. In infrastructure and investment decisions for cities, uh, and I think that um, that that relates also to the range of taxes that uh, are available to local authorities. Nobody's looking at this, and all the political parties refuse to look at it. Uh, but they ought to have a consensus that they will all look at it because this is a major weakener for Scotland's cities, and therefore for all of Scotland. That all the decisions and all the resources. Basically, lie. I'm not saying the Scottish government uh, does things badly. That's a, a different issue. The fact that cities don't get the chance to raise and use the resources. That's the first thing. Second thing, um, in relation to delivering, uh, I kind of agree with Anna that uh, I was being tough in 15 minute neighbourhoods because I don't see it as a rolled out solution. I see it as an idea that informs you in some places. But that's not the way the professions are talking about it, nor indeed the uh, uh, the government statement about it is this is the solution, and I'm saying no, it isn't. 
if we're talking in generality. What would make a difference? And I agree with, uh, I started off my remarks by saying I did think it was really important to have accessible infrastructures and services for everybody, and especially poor people. And we should have implemented a lot more of the Christie Commission, and we wouldn't have been uh, stripped down in many of these poorer places that we have. So, good ideas. Christie Commission didn't get implemented. 15 minute neighbourhoods, good idea. Will it get implemented? Two things really need, uh, I'll believe it, uh, will be the solution when I see a neighbourhood investment strategy for the metropolitan region. What is the neighbourhood investment strategy for infrastructure and service infrastructure? That's going to deliver all these uh, good new projects that Jenny's talking about. The avenues is great, nowhere near enough. What about all the other uh, places? So where's the strategy? What's the time period? And secondly, within that, when Wendy Alexander took the community planning bill through Parliament, it wasn't actually about bureaucrats uh, from all the major agencies and the council sitting and talking to each other. It was actually about a platform for communities with plans and ideas to talk to those who were more centrally located in the council and at a national level. Uh, I left Scotland for about eight years after I worked in government. That's a good idea. Uh, you can uh, people forget what you did. Uh, uh, so um, I do think I was astonished when I came back about what community planning had been. If we want real power in neighbourhoods and a real say. Rethink what you're doing in community planning, and actually make it about communities, not just a discussion between, you know, the Scottish Futures Trust or the Council or National Health. Or whatever. That's all right, uh, and that discussion has to take place. But who's talking to the communities in that context? Nobody. It's an interesting challenge, uh, and I mean, a recent example which I encountered was actually um, with in Garnet Hill, where there, an avenues project was planned to be built up into woodlands. Uh, and Woodside, uh, and because the the M8 is falling down at Cowcaddens, basically this project has had to be cancelled because the Scottish government wants to come in and rebuild the, or Transport Scotland wants to come in and rebuild this motorway. <laughs> so it's a bit of an unfortunate tension where it shows that actually when the chips are down, you know, national trunk road priorities will trump local communities, and there still seems to be that power imbalance. Certainly, my uh, experience in the last few months. So I think, yeah, you're right. I think maybe there is a potential challenge there that we need to rebalance power in favour of local communities and give them more agency. I just wanted to touch and move towards this idea of retrofit and I suppose tying in the idea of local empowerment and one of the most important and, and uh, significant examples of community empowerment in Scotland in the last few decades has been the creation of the community housing associations uh, which kind of came out of the tenement demolitions in, in Glasgow mainly in the 1970s. Um, so communities like Govan uh, and Deniston resisted the demolition of their tenements, and they've stood the test of time. I think it's fair to say that actually building a soulless peripheral housing schemes was was a bad decision for Scotland, and and uh, maintaining the tenement communities has been important. But of course, much of Scotland's cities were built in this very rapid period of industrial expansion between the eighteen fifties and nineteen fourteen. How do we actually deal with the legacy of you know, as Anna will know, seventy six thousand pre nineteen nineteen homes in Glasgow? Um, we're facing a, a maintenance uh, backlog, which I believe is estimated to be three billion pounds. You know, the climate emergency is going to increase the the pressure on the, the maintenance of these buildings and it's, you know the urban centres of of our great cities. How do we tackle that big challenge? How do we build the sort of infrastructure, the policy around it to respond to? Um, I suppose that's a big issue to finance. Um, we know notoriously people hate their factors. You know, they're not they're not responsive enough. Maybe the legislation around tenements isn't good enough. How do we design good legislation to sort of deal with this major issue that we're going to face in the next de couple of decades? So um, maybe open it up with with Joanna just to see what you, what you think. Sorry, it's probably something going to take longer than a few minutes to answer, but, but maybe if you do your best to sort of uh, touch on some of the issues. Yeah, I'll I'll try and skirt on it very briefly. And, and housing is not part of my portfolio, so um, I I'm not the one that's leading on um, trying to tackle these. But certainly, um, I represent a, a very highly tenemented ward. It's one of the densest. Um, in in Glasgow, so um, I'm very aware of some of the challenges around factoring, um, around um, as you say maintenance. Um, we have a problem with maintenance now because of years in which maintenance hasn't happened on a routine basis for you know many of these private owners or private landlords. So absolutely, that's very challenging um, now to to make sure that all tenements are, are being brought up to the standard they need to be. And how do we manage that if they're privately owned? Um, what role does uh, does public 
funding have within that, and that's certainly um, something a challenge for us as a council. Um, but we also need to talk about not just maintaining the status quo, but bringing those tenements into a state that is, is ready for a decarbonised city. Uh, that's a huge challenge. You'll be well aware of the, the pilot scheme that's going on at the moment over in the south side um, within the Dre Road tenement, and that's starting to unpick some of those challenges. But that's being done in, in sort of research circumstances. That's being done in, uh, with, with nobody living in that property, in that set of properties. How are we going to then upscale some of the lessons from that into all the tenements across the city? I think that is a huge challenge, um, and you know we, we need to, to try and refine our, our learning from that project, and then think about how we, we move forward with it. Um, but it certainly is a huge challenge. But on the other hand, um, while tenements might be a bit leaky in terms of, of heat coming out of them, um, especially for retaining the bay windows and you know all the, the features that people love about the high ceilings, etc., um, what they do enable is very high quality, high density living, um, and that is a huge sustainability bonus for our city. That we do still have a large number of our population living um, within streets that are are very well designed, are very walkable, um, do still have that sense of community about them, um, and do enable us to. To get a lot of people moved around the city using public transport, using active travel, because they are close together. Um, I think we've got a huge opportunity there. But on the flip side, of course, we have a huge challenge with the fabric of the buildings as well. Thanks very much for that, Anna. Um, I've got a question from Flora. Um, she says, I think around 28% of people in Scotland live in tenements, which is probably well above the UK average. If, if probably, I don't know how it compares to other European countries, but quite a significant percentage living in communal tenement buildings. Uh, what are local authorities doing to make sure tenement dwellers aren't penalised when it comes to things like electric car charging, alternatives to gas boilers, and access to green space? Um, so quite a, quite a big range of issues to tackle there, but maybe some thoughts on maybe how Glasgow is thinking about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're all quite disparate issues, um, and they are absolutely all, um, you know, very significant challenges that we need to be thinking about. Uh, in terms of the EV charging, that's something that we need to be very clear with the public about. That um, while I think the the impression of EV charging up till now has been, you know, it's easy to get a grant. You've got a driveway. You can um, charge your vehicle overnight. Everything's very simple if you have a driveway. But that's not the reality. For a huge number um, of, of our citizens. So we need to be thinking about how do people um, fuel those vehicles when, when they move to EV. And that's going to have to be um, not just the council putting in rapid chargers, um, but it's also got to be about all the other organisations, businesses, companies that um, expect vehicle journeys to be made. They need to be thinking about how they are managing that, whether that's in your gym car park, your supermarket, um, anywhere that you go and park your vehicle. Um, we have to think about how they are managing their charging network. It can't just be the council that does that. But what we need to do is make sure that there's enough EV charging facilities within areas that it's it's a relatively straightforward journey to get there to plug in to do a rapid charge or, or a top up. Um, but certainly, I think that the model that is being rolled out for the more suburban properties around you plug your car in overnight and you leave it there isn't going to work uh, for people in tenements because we just we know what it's like. You, you often have to to go looking for a parking space. You know, um, several streets away, you don't have that reliability of knowing exactly where you can charge. There are um, some some options out there around um, charges that work well on street, um, but even so, I think we need to talk very seriously about how people charge and what their charging habits are, um, and how the, the private sector can really help us out with that as well, um, and, and to maintain that network. Um, in terms of green spaces, that's perhaps more one for Jenny. Um, if you you want to throw it towards her, or uh, I'm happy to contribute to that as well. No worries. Um, well, Jenny, I suppose it is quite a t attention because you know dense den tenement neighbourhoods they offer challenges, particularly around space. You know, we've seen challenges around car parking conflicts, especially notorious in tenement communities, for example. Um, but huge opportunities as well. I guess there's things around you know com greater com communality of of services. You know, you could even have such things like a shared kitchen space, shared growing space, um, shared laundry facilities. Uh, you know, might be able to pull more of these things together and make it more energy efficient uh, and utilise space more efficiently. So just interested in some of the thoughts of the opportunities of, of maybe tenement communities and how we can actually retrofit tenements um, to realise a much more sustainable model of living that's not so you know, um, uh, atomised that everyone has the, all their own duplicate equipment and, and the one close. You know? um, and so my area of expertise is probably less tenement specifically, but more on kind of the spaces in between the buildings and and definitely in those more kind of denser 
city areas, including where there are tenements as well. Like you're saying, there's I mean, there's a whole host of ways that I think the spaces outside the building can actually support those communities and make a, a nicer place to live more generally. So, I mean, you've mentioned a few examples there, but there's also things like um, bike ownership. Like it's it's often hard if you I've lived in a lot of tenements and like trying to carry your bike on your shoulder up to the top flat isn't always you know the most practical or having somewhere to put a buggy is not always that easy. Like there's a lot of, um, whilst there's a huge amount of benefits of having denser living and living in tenements, like, you know, a lot of the social benefits as well. Something that I wonder about is like, how can we help support those, like delivering on those benefits? So whether it's having, ensuring the space for shared bike parking integrated into like the street adjacent, perhaps you lose one car parking space, but you end up having like a, and um, you know, one of the bike shelters that allows people then to more easily access their bike. I think there's ways that our built environment can better support tenements and make sure that actually some of this act that that's not a disadvantage in any way um, in terms of living in terms of living in a more dense area compared to a less dense area that has a driveway or something. So I think there's a few different ways that that can that you can kind of build on that and that shared communal green spaces are another really great example one of the perks of living somewhere that is more dense is that you you know you bump into your neighbors a lot more there's a lot more potential there for forming those social connections and if you can do that through really quality green space um then then that's that's fantastic Thanks very much, Jenny. Some some interesting opportunities. So it's not all it's not all pessimism. <laughs> there you go. Um, Duncan, um, I suppose I'm interested to get your thoughts on you know how do we tackle the the, the issue of the legacy of Glasgow, of Glasgow particularly, but the rest of Scotland's tenemental communities. How do we retrofit these buildings for the future? What opportunities are around the financing and economics of it in particular? Uh, given we've got this three billion pound maintenance backlog, how are we going to tackle it? It can't just simply be up to the the tenants or the the mortgage holders, can it? Um, well, uh, I think you mentioned the uh, uh, development of housing associations and tenemental buildings through the 1970s. Uh, I actually started working in housing in University of Glasgow in 1974. So I think there's a couple of key lessons from the period you refer to that can be thought about in principle now. The tenement renewal uh, program took place, the Housing Association and other private grant-led activity, because there was a strict implementation of the standards of the 1974 Housing Scotland Act. It defined how you needed to improve or repair a dwelling, and it was enforced really strictly in Glasgow. Uh, Edinburgh uh, uh, enforced it much more lightly, and its tenement stock ran behind in terms of upgrading, ran behind Glasgow, and as indeed did Dundee uh, for a long period of time. So, going forward on uh, being concerned about carbon, we need new standards for our housing in terms of energy and insulation and everything else. Everyone agrees that. And we can think of the archetypes uh, and the costs uh, associated with them. The second thing that would come out of it is. It, this was a huge job for Glasgow City, which had a lot more staff then than it has now, and it would never have achieved it without the help of the Housing Corporation uh, at that time. Uh, so the question is capacity to do this, and this really worries me about big initiatives in Scotland, local authority staffing for thinking and delivering and strategic management is so stripped down. Big programmes like this are going to be really difficult. So they need a legislative framework about standards. They need capabilities of staff. In terms of finance, uh, poor people, if you want to have good quality homes for poor people, uh, I did a review of such uh, programmes for OECD and the World Bank at different times in my career. You never get it unless you provide subsidies of 65 to 70 per cent of the cost of a building. Poor people can't afford decent housing, and that's even truer now than it was when I did that work. So we're going to have to increase the size of the affordable housing programme in Scotland. I think it needs to be roughly doubled to make progress into upgrading costs, unless there are special funds, as I know there uh, is uh, in, in, in line for uh, the, this experimental phase. But I think Glasgow has the right vision about what it's doing with its tenement stock and should be really commended. Your other European cities will be saying, oh, look at that sustainable Glasgow place. Uh, in other words, that's a great initiative. Uh, you have to think more carefully through what the employment effects. I was involved in uh, persuading people 
in Glasgow amongst others to uh, vote for the Glasgow housing transfer. But within government, there was a huge amount of work done by the Labour government at that time to make sure the employment agencies and training agencies had skills and apprenticeships lined up to be employed by the I think we've lost them again, uh, but, but we'll continue. I've got one question actually from Graham and Dumfries, who's asking about if there are any feasible schemes to implement district heating projects within our cities and large towns. Um, I don't know, either Jenny or Anna, if you've got any thoughts on, I don't know, particularly maybe in Glasgow, if there are, are pilots planned uh, around district heating. I think there was one in the Athletes' Village in Dalmarnock, but I'm not sure if there's any more proposed. I suppose it's a big opportunity, particularly for tenement communities. Um, Anna, do you have any thoughts at all? Yeah, absolutely. There is district heating, as you say, already in Glasgow, but we need to roll that out on a far bigger scale. We need to utilise the, the heat that's in the, the Clyde, um, and we need to look at taking heat off, for example, our Recycling Renewable Energy Centre um, over at Paul Medee, um, because that is, you know, it, it's, it's managing our residual waste through, um, you know, from our general uh, waste collections. Um, we're already generating electricity there. That's helping to, to go back into the grid and so on, but it generates heat as well, and we need to find uh, ways of connecting that up and, and using that heat um, because that's what's going to maximise the, um, the the climate impact or the, the climate benefit of of having that um, waste treatment plant there. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it's something that's being looked at um, with University of Strathclyde. It's it's being worked up um, through our own council policies as well, and we're certainly um, district heating will have to be part of the solution, um, especially to densely populated parts of the city, um, as as well as heat pumps. Heat pumps are also uh, individual heat pumps are also going to be important, but district heating really has to be part of the solution. Great, thanks very much. We look forward to hearing more about those um, proposals for Glasgow, certainly in the coming weeks and months, or well, months and years, probably, well, maybe not weeks is very ambitious, but uh, maybe we'll hear more about during COP, uh, then that may be an opportunity. But I just wanted to say um, thank you all for your contributions to the event. And before we close, um, hopefully we'll get Duncan back, but um, I'd just like to give each of our panellists a minute just to sum up quite the, the wide ranging uh, issues raised in the discussion. So, um, Jenny, can I start with you and then I'll, I'll, I'll move to Anna and then hopefully we'll get Duncan back before the, the end. Uh, thanks, Jenny. Sure. Um, thanks so much for having me. This has been really, really interesting. And um, I think some of the key things that um, I guess in some of some of the things that I was mentioning earlier around kind of you know, the importance of public spaces, about how it's really those kind of everyday and like experience, like lived experience of the city is really important, particularly if we're moving towards more sustainable cities. It influences the kind of the choices you make as an individual, but also the importance of that, of that kind of top down and bottom up and generally as a society kind of a city deciding how do we want to use our urban spaces like that's because that's how we can decide how like how do we want to fund them what's important what, what do we want our city to ultimately look like and then trying to work together to try and achieve that because actually i think some of the ideas of the 15 minute city you know they may seem idealistic in some ways but at the same time there's a lot of evidence that actually by investing in quality public space in the city in this way actually it's it kind of pays for itself in the long term through public health through the economics you know better spaces for cafes to spill out into the public like it all kind of it works long term so um just yeah just a note to say thank you and um thanks for having me as part of this debate thanks very much jenny uh, anna would you like to just offer a summation of what your your thoughts and reflections were yeah, I think um, what's been really heartening about this hour is we've been talking about climate, but it's been quite tangential. We've been talking about people's lives, we've been talking about inequality, about poverty, we've talked about children, we've talked about older people, we've talked about bringing communities together, about social interaction, um, and to me that's what climate action should be talking about. Um, often we have climate conversations around the technology, um, around the innovation that's needed from a technical perspective to decarbonise, but actually what I find most exciting is when we're talking about what these climate solutions can bring to our people, um, to our communities, and, and how we, we just really improve people's lives along the way. Um, so I feel it's been that kind of conversation this afternoon. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Anna, and, and thanks, Jenny. I think it has been a really useful um, discussion. It's broken into a whole number of dimensions that interact in our everyday lives, our well-being sense of, you know, uh, how much pride we have in our communities, engagement, and you know, there's a lot of issues around class and inequality that we need to unpack there as well. So I think we've not just nudged on some of the issues we need to tackle uh, as a country in the coming in the coming years. So thanks very much for your insights today. It's been really useful, and I'm sorry, um, fortunately, Duncan's not going to be able to. Join us for his summation, but I think his, his contribution today has been really useful. Um, uh, we must end there, um, and I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today and making such a, a significant contribution to our panel. 
that was brought to you in partnership with the University of Glasgow. Again, thanks to our panel, Jenny Elliott, Duncan McLennan and Councillor Anna Richardson for giving up your time this afternoon to take part. Uh, may I take this opportunity to, to remind you that we have one more festival panel before we bring this year's festival to a close, and that is on the subject of prioritising mental health, which starts at 6 p.m. Uh, this evening, so in an hour's time, and I do hope you can join those discussions. So thanks very much for your attention.